Senate Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Today is Monday, March 21st. It is 1 p.m. Um, we let the record show that we have a quorum. Uh, today, the first bill up is Senate File 4020. Senator Weber, welcome to the committee. And you may start when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Senate File 4020 deals with the allocation of acreage uh, from a lake for the purposes of a road improvement project. Uh, for the last number of years, uh, Murray County, Minnesota has had a uh, had a uh, engineer that rated their highway system. And this particular stretch of road has been considered the most hazardous stretch of county highway system uh, in the entire county. It is a road that links the mainland with three water crossings joining two islands uh, as the road transpires. And on these islands, you have an assortment of campgrounds, a resort, a um, uh, restaurant, private homes, a church Bible camp. And in the summertime, as you can imagine, the traffic becomes pretty heavy, uh, both in terms of vehicular traffic, pedestrian traffic. And what we're really seeing right now is we see parents pushing babies and strollers down the traffic lane uh, just because there's not sufficient room for them to go. And, um, and there's a uh, PowerPoint presentation, I believe, that, that will be available when the county engineer speaks uh, that shows uh, uh, some of the issues that are, that are there. Uh, this, uh, this road flooded in 2018 a uh, couple of different times. Um, and last fall, even though we didn't have high water, during a heavy rain period of time, uh, a couple drove their vehicle off the road into the lake. Unfortunately, no one uh, lost their life or was injured, but it is without sufficient shoulders and safety precautions, it is a very dangerous stretch of road. And uh, we, the county has uh, been working with the DNR for a number of years. Uh, I had the commissioner out there two and a half years ago. Um, we have a couple of sources of funding fun working their way through the legislature. Uh, and I was not necessarily comfortable that we would have an agreement as to the acreage that would be needed uh, in order to provide for the improvement of this road. Thus, you have Senate File 4020. Uh, at this point, Madam Chair, uh, I would uh, be willing to turn the testifiers table over to uh, Mr. Randy Groves, who is the county engineer for Murray County, and I believe he is joining us online. Senator Weber, I believe you have a small oral technical amendment to the bill. Would you like to present that? That is correct. The bill refers to County State 8 Highway 113 and it's County State 8 Highway 13. Thank you, Senator Weber. All those in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carried. Thank you, Senator Weber. Um, then we'll go to your testifier, Mr. Groves. He is uh, remote. Welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Groves, and please identify yourself for the um, record. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, this is Randy Groves. I'm the county engineer here at Murray County. I've uh, been with the county for 20, 20 plus years, uh, 27, I believe. Um, and I do have a little bit of a slideshow kind of put together, a presentation, if you will, it kind of, um, gives you a visual uh, of what we're trying to accomplish out there and some of the problems that we've had. So if, if possible, I'll try to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes, we are, sir. Okay, great. Uh, is that first screen, uh, say Casaw 13, potential improvements, Lake Chatech area? That would be correct. Great. Okay, I'll start. Uh, this is a presentation really uh, uh, that I've uh, borrowed a few slides from a couple different documents. Uh, one is a feasibility study and another is an environmental assessment worksheet that we had done. Uh, let me get to that. Um, from our consultant engineering, uh, just a quick blurb about them. They're Houston Engineering. They've done several of these types of projects uh, throughout the state, I believe. Uh, Murray County hired them uh, to do a feasibility study 
Back after the flood in, of 2018, we, we felt a lot of pressure from the area residents to get something done. Um, these are the two gentlemen that we've worked with uh, most, mostly on this project. Uh, Murray County State Aid Highway 13 runs east and west from uh, Trunk Highway 59 all the way through Keeley Island. So uh, Trunk Highway 59 is off to the left here. If you can see my cursor move and Keeley Island is over here. So it's about a two mile stretch of road altogether. We're just kind of zeroed in here on the third uh, three dikes, but um, that, that's what we call them. These are the roads that were constructed probably back in the WPA days. Uh, so we got dike one, dike two, and dike three. Uh, the uh, lake has experienced several high water events over the last 10 years. Uh, the highest event of recent record occurred in the summer of 2018. Uh, I've never seen the water that high, although the road has flooded in the past, uh, nothing compared to 2018. Um, all three dikes really uh, were, were affected by that. Uh, dike one was completely underwater. Dike two, about half of the dike was underwater and dike three was completely submerged, probably like two feet of water. So uh, our project, um, I'll give you a project description. I promise I won't read a lot of these. This is the last one I'm going to read, but I'm just going to say it for the record. Murray County Highway Department is proposing the reconstruction and raising of Casaw 13 along dikes one, two, and three, and the installation of a shared use path. The project is located along Casaw 13 from Trunk Highway 59 across dikes one, two, and three, and to Keeley Island at Lake Chatech. Lake Chatech's uh, water levels fluctuate seasonally during times of high water floods and floods portion of each dike causing transportation issues and potential hazards to the public. The road raise would allow the dikes to remain accessible during similar events to what was experienced in 2018. The road will include two 12 foot wide shoulder or I'm sorry, two foot, two 12 foot wide lanes, driving lanes with four foot shoulders meeting our current state aid standards. So if we reconstruct this road, we have to build it to those standards. That's the minimum. Uh, the project also includes the installation of a shared use path from the intersection of Trunk Highway 59 to Keeley Island that will provide the public with safe access to recreational activities such as biking, walking, hiking, and shoreland fishing. The uh, shared use path will be constructed along the south side of the road from Trunk Highway 59 up to Dyke 1, and then along the north and south sides of Casaw 13 from across Dykes 1, 2, and 3. Across the islands, an eight foot wide walkable shoulder will be incorporated on the north and south sides of Casaw 13. The walkable shoulder will also be extended east of Valhalla Island through the existing bridge where it will be transitioned to a separate shared use path to accommodate recreational uses. Uh, as Senator Weber uh, pointed out, the, the, the volume of people during the summer months is, is just something to, to be seen, I guess you might say. Um, the road is very narrow. He was right, it is our number one uh, road that we have, uh, I guess the poorest condition of shoulder. There's absolutely nowhere to step off uh, to get out of the way of uh, traffic out here. So uh, if you can see by this slide, this is the project corridor that we're talking about. I'm gonna use my cursor, cursor, hopefully it'll pop up here. Trunk Highway 59 runs north and south. It's a US highway that runs from Minnesota to Texas. But uh, uh, this particular stretch of road really connects the <clears throat> towns of Slayton and Marshall. And that's uh, the beginning of the project. Uh, right there at that intersection. It will extend east approximately two miles, I guess you might say. And of course, during that, uh, uh, we'll cross all three dikes. Um, this particular slide I, I found interesting. Uh, this is dike number one, and I'm just gonna skip ahead just one slide here. This is called the uh, first dike, and this is the picture that we're looking at right here. Uh, this is a area of a road that was submerged probably in about six to eight inches of water for several days. Um, 
There was also washouts along the shoulder of the road. So if the car got too close to the edge, it would actually fall into the lake. Uh, this is kind of a good graphic here to kind of show you our problem uh, area. Potentially, uh, you know, we've, we've just got hundreds and hundreds of people out there at any given day during the summer months, especially, but uh, there are homes and uh, cabins located all over this area. But as you can see, there's a large campsite here uh, that continues to grow. Uh, these are all homes and stuff. Uh, this road here up up here is, is uh, Lakeview Drive, but it is also just full of homes on both sides of the road. Uh, more cabins down in here. This is Valhalla Island. Uh, this has businesses such as a camp, uh, well, campground, obviously, but uh, some cabins and whatnot. We've got a Shatek Marina is right here. Uh, we've got a steakhouse and bar and grill right here. We've got a hotel and we've got some nice homes along this side. Coming across Third Dyke over here at Keeley Island, uh, we've got a Shatek uh, Lutheran Bible Camp located in this area and homes that extend all the way down to the uh, south. Uh, background of problems, uh, obviously flooding. We, we experience flooding uh, rather frequently. I guess every four or five years, it seems like we get some sort of flood event down here. And uh, uh, we've really got a large safety problem with the pedestrians that are using this road. Um, they're, they're mixed in with the traffic and, and uh, makes it very difficult. Um, this area is also heavily used for fishing and on both sides of the road. So the next few slides here um, are just photographs of, of the flood that we experienced in 2018. This is uh, the first dike as you come into the lake area. And uh, this is kind of the beginning of the flood. We're having quite a bit of downpour right at this point. The road is already underwater. And uh, we've lost most of our shoulder along this area. And as time went on, it undermined the blacktop and, and washed away a good portion of this uh, eastbound lane. Uh, here's a gentleman uh, out checking the undermining of that road. We see a car that's trying to traverse that area with no, <laughs> no idea. I mean, if you've ever driven, driven through floodwaters, it's very uh, uh, intimidating. This is second dike. We also have a bridge located on that dike. Uh, this portion of the road was underwater as well. We had a lot of floating debris that was related to the flood, such as docks, uh, boats, you name it, whatever. That was all, you know, located up on the road and whatnot. Uh, this road, this is our third dike. Um, uh, looking off to the east, uh, we've got two people that are just walking across here. You can see that his knees are completely submerged. It was at least two feet or 18 inches, I would say, uh, over the road uh, that, that way. And um, here, here's a, a slide of a military-style vehicle that we're rescuing residents of that island and uh, the Bible camp off, you know, the, during that flood. Uh, this road is underwater for several days as well. And uh, as Senator Weber mentioned, uh, there was a car that drove off the lake last year because of the narrow shoulders. Uh, uh, there's no recovery once you get off the edge. Uh, th this couple drove in, but fortunately there was no serious uh, outcome of that other than the car. <clears throat> um, I, I'm, I'm Kind of wrapping this up, hopefully this isn't too technical, but if you take the road and cut it like a loaf of bread and then look at the end of that road, that's called a, a typical section, if you will. And this top one is uh, kind of what we have. We've got a, a 12 foot driving lane and then the shoulder here says one to two feet, although I know it's not that in several locations. The uh, proposed project, that's what we're we're trying to accomplish out here. Not only are we trying to raise the road to uh, get it up out of the uh, flood elevation, if you will, um, and then provide two paths, one on each side of the, the uh, road here for folks to be able to walk and, and bike and whatever. Um, so we've got our road here, two 12 foot lanes and, and a four foot shoulder, a grassed area, this is an eight foot shared use path. 
more grassed area and then rip rap into the lake. Um, we, we tried to minimize the height of the road because as you raise the road, you take more lakes. So we've got really pretty much the elevation set uh, for this road, just so, just so that it's high and dry during a flood event that we experienced in say 2018, but uh, to minimize the impact on the lake. Um, here is first dike again. We're looking at about a six tenths of a foot uh, road raise. Second dike, we're looking at about four tenths of a foot. And on third dike, we're looking at a two foot raise in the dike. Because remember, it was 18 inches or so submerged uh, that time. And there's a photograph right there. Uh, in terms of acres of the lake that's affected, uh, we're, we're seeking that uh, uh, option where we would have a path on both sides because it's really important to the people out there and we've witnessed it, you know, the, just the, the volume of people that are using this road to get around that area um, with a, a path on both sides of the road, uh, we'd affect uh, just under two acres of lake. And that's the end of my slideshow. Um, Hopefully it'll generate some questions. If you have, uh, I can certainly try to answer those. Thank you, Mr. Groves. I think we will go on to our um, our next testifier. If you would stay with us, please. So, for we'll have yes. questions afterwards. Thank, Thank you. you. I believe uh, Mr. Meyer would like to uh, assistant commissioner from the DNR would like to testify. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members, for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. And first and foremost, I, I do want to say that we have been working with Senator Weber and Murray County on this issue for several years right now. We most recently submitted a, a comment letter on an EAW that is uh, out there for the first Dyke project, I believe, or Dyke One. Um, our testimony, my testimony is, is pretty limited. It just it relies on that, that we are still working with, with the Senator. We do have concerns about the, the language in the bill um, withstanding it from basically public water fill, Wetland Conservation Act requirements and other things that are required on these types of projects. But we do stand committed and ready to work with, with the author and the county on that. Madam Chair, I do have one question about the bill as it's drafted. In subdivision one, it says, notwithstanding any other provision of law, the commissioner must do all of the following, issue any permits applied for to the county as part of the project, convey to the county any right of way easement or other interest in real property, so forth. And then on subdivision three, it says reporting, it says the commissioner of natural resources must immediately report to the chairs and ranking members, any denial, the denial of any permit or other requests made by Murray County on line 2.4, then it goes on to issue the reporting. Um, given the notwithstanding clause in section one, I don't see the need for that reporting section in section three, unless I'm missing something. Uh, section one tells us we have to do something and then subdivision three would say, well, if you don't do what you're told to do, report to us. So that's just one question I have on the, on the bill language in front of us, Madam Chair. Thank I can you. stand for any questions. Senator Weber. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I would uh, defer to Mr. Stanley on this point. Mr. Stanley. Madam Chair, members, um, there are permitting there are permitting requirements that are not just state permits, though, right? That may or may not be required to do this work. And so I think it would apply to those, as well as there are times where state law requires a permit to be issued and it isn't issued. Uh, in you know the time that it's supposed to be, so I think the reporting language deals with both of those two contingencies. Thank you, members. Are there any other questions, Senator Senjum? Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, our, our our bonding committee was there uh, recently. It's hard to remember years anymore, but. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Meyer, is, is the fundamental uh, concern here just the, the widening of the road and the, and the utilization of the, of, the, of the lake, if you will, for road purposes? Uh, is, that, is that the issue? Uh, 
Mr. Mayor. Madam Chair, Senator Senjum, uh, that and the ecological impacts to the water body as well. The, the dikes that are there do prohibit water movement, especially Dike 3, the way I understand it. But the fill in the public water, uh, widening the road, our estimate just on the, the Dike 1 project would be about 2.45 acres of fill that would, or water that you would lose due to filling of that water body to build, the, to expand the roadway. So it, it's the wetland, it's a wetland replacement, the impacts of the, to the public water um, impacts to fish and wildlife habitat, as well as increased erosion or things that may occur by design um, unless they're, they're dealt with adequately. Senator Sendrum. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, perceptibly, it, it, it's a fairly big lake and it, you know, taking, I don't know, 20 feet on each side uh, or whatever it is, uh, you know, it's a pretty big lake. You, you don't perceive that a lot of that lake would be lost for a lot of purposes if, uh, if the roads were wider, but that's that's a lay view. <laughs> Madam Chair. <laughs> Senator Weber. Thank you. Uh, I would also mention that certainly part of the design of this uh, highway is uh, there are going to be large culverts that are put uh, in this road uh, and to deal with water movement. Uh, if you also, as you look at the map, this is not necessarily a, a situation where you're isolating a part of the lake. Uh, by virtue of the road, basically these islands have become a large peninsula, you know, joined by the road and water around is goes totally around the lake. And, um, and so what you, what you really have there is because of the culverts, uh, you still have a movement of water going underneath the road, um, you know, to the, to the, from the north, south, south to north, and depending on the wind that particular day. Uh, and certainly those areas of the lake and the, of the road catch a fair amount of wind. As you look at the amount of lake surface that's to the north and south of those, of those dikes, uh, you see where uh, the wind can pick up pretty good speed and, and some days there's pretty good wave action coming in uh, on, that, uh, on that roadbed and, and certainly points to the need for substantial riprap and, and con erosion control methods um, you know, when that time comes. Members, are there further questions? Senator Weber, um, it was mentioned that there was um, homes out on those islands. So are those seasonal seasonal homes? Are that people live out there year round? Or uh, it's, I'd be curious to know. Madam Chair, there, there are both. There are some that are seasonal, but there are also year round homes out there. And so when the road floods and, and is there snow plowing out there? I mean, it, it seems like kind of a remote place to live year round. I mean, even from our, my neck of the woods, it's kind of, you know. Being a county state aid highway, Madam Chair, uh, there is uh, maintenance is provided, snow plowing is done. And, um, and uh, so it, it is treated like any other county state aid highway. Oh, thank you. Members, other questions? Oh, Senator Herr? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, maybe this question could be directed to Mr. Groves. I I, and Senator Weber too. I, I was wondering how often is the flood uh, take place annually? Senator Mr. Weber. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Herr. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Groves probably has more historical data available to him than I do concerning that issue. And I would turn the testifiers table over to him. Mr. Groves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, uh, since my tenure here, like I said, I've been around for about 27 years. I, I would guess no less than um, probably five to six times during that time that we've, re uh, you know, we've had flooding out there. Um, the couple things I'd like to point out, I don't know if my share, my screen is still shared, but I'm pointing here at First Dyke. I don't know if you can see that. I don't but, believe your screen oh, sharing, but go ahead. Fine. That, that's fine, but uh, First Dyke has a set of box culverts and really the water flows uh, into the lake from a tributary there. And so um, there is quite a bit of flow through the road itself, but we're looking at hydraulically putting some uh, the need for more culverts on that section of road. Second Dyke has a bridge, uh, like Senator Weber mentioned, with the wave action that we see out there, the wind blows out here quite often. And um, we would get quite a bit of water movement through that uh, dike. Third dike, however, is one that uh, 
has been an issue for quite some time. We're looking at installing some culverts there to help uh, the, the uh, water quality uh, on the south side of the, the road there. So um, we're trying to um, improve, I guess you might say, uh, some of the things that happen when during a flood, uh, much of our road gets washed away and that gets put into the lake and we're trying to prevent that from happening with our new project. Uh, a question was raised about the houses. Most of, most of this property has all been converted from cabins many, many years ago to year round homes. There are very few uh, summer cabins anymore. Um, most of the properties all purchased and have uh, very high expensive homes out there, so. Thank you, Senator Herr. Um, thank you, Mr. Grove, it's good to know. And um, I know human life is, you know, more important, but uh, what, what's this traffic level? You know, um, since you say that uh, the, the cabin has been turned to homes, you know, are there heavy traffic going back and forth utilize those dikes? Yes, yes it is. It's really the only way in and out of the islands. Um, this is the only road that serves that purpose out there. There's no other way for them to get off the islands and uh, for all those homes. Uh, traffic counts, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me, but uh, several thousand, I'm sure, a uh, couple thousand for sure. Um, but in the summer, the, the, the increased lake activity out there and the visitors and whatnot, um, the campground activity, uh, if you put all those people on the road at one time, you can imagine the, the uh, kind of the mess that we have going on. So we, we have really two problems, two really large problems. We have, um, uh, you know, a flooding issue where people are trapped. And then we've got the safety of the, the public out there that have to get from uh, one place to another, either by car or um, uh, just walking and enjoying the lake. So, thank you, and, Senator Hurst. Yes, and Mr. Grove, did I hear you right that um, within the range of seven years, there's flood around four or five times? Correct. Okay. Mr. Grove. And, you know, um, Madam Chair, I suppose this is just a, and also on Senator Weber, I suppose this is a, a policy bill only. Uh, if there's construction involved, there will be funding, right? Is there funding? Are we, you know, um, reserve for that. Uh, Senator, to... Senator Weber. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Herr. I have two bills that are have been dropped. One is through the bonding process and one is uh, directly to the uh, Transportation Committee. And Senator Herr, this, we are moving this bill to the Finance Committee from okay. here. Okay. Senator Herr. Um, thank, thank you for, thank you for the, the information. I, you know, do have, uh, a, a different op opinion, you know, I, I, it appeared to me that this bill almost like, uh, you know, hand tied to DNR, you know, I know that reporting needs to get back to us, you know, as ranking members. And, um, you know, uh, I, I will, you know, evaluate that. And uh, as, as this bill travel forward, make my decision in supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I just have some concerns about the the bigger picture here. It seems to me, you know, you've you've explained the need for um, for needed the urgency in wanting to move forward with this, and I think we all understand that and are very sympathetic with it. Um, but we're also hearing that the agency is working actively um, in with with all of you to move this this project and get done what needs to be done my concern is that as we move forward we all know that we're going to see more and more of these um, extreme rain events and weather events i am concerned about the precedent that we could be setting if we um sort of circumvent the usual process with the dnr in this particular case because this is just the tip of the iceberg, if you will. We're going to have lots and lots of events like this and a need and an urgency um, to make repairs and to have changes made. So, um, you know, and, and I would point to um, things like the budget that the MPCA has put forward in the bonding proposal um, in the supplemental budget um, to provide for infrastructure funding to shore up 
all of the things that we're going to need to shore up for climate change and to make sure we're ready for that. So um, I'm, this is just more of a comment than any kind of a question, but I'm, I have some concerns about setting this kind of a precedent where we're circumventing our agency. Thank you. Senator Weber, comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I recognize the concern about uh, us uh, taking a proactive stance here and, and you know, possibly tying the department's hands. I have dropped this bill and presented this bill because quite frankly, um, I don't believe that my local folks are um, confident that the uh, DNR has taken their concerns as, uh, as seriously as they should have. Um, you know, this first determination was made a number of years ago about the dangerous uh, aspects of, of this highway, and, and yet they meet in resistance with, from the DNR uh, anytime they bring up proposed plans. Uh, they wanted to go ahead. They had to resurface that road after the flood. They would have liked to have proceeded with a, a major uh, rebuilding of that road at that time, but they couldn't, uh, um, they couldn't get uh, the necessary approval at that point in time. And, um, you know, the reality of it is, as relates to the question about language that was brought up, uh, quite frankly, agencies don't always do what they've been instructed to do. And so uh, I, think that, uh, I think that for us to actually put this in law, to indicate that we intend to provide for the public safety uh, uh, on this particular project, is an appropriate thing to do. And, um, uh, and with that, Madam Chair, that would be my final comment and I urge your consideration of this, of this bill. Thank you, members. Are there other questions? Thank you. Um, Senator Lang, would you like to make the motion to move the bill to environment finance? Senator Lang moves that Senate file 4020 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Environment Finance Committee. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, next on our agenda, uh, we have Senate file 2797. Um, this is Senator Tomasoni's bill. Um, I believe he is, um, He's listening today, so welcome Senator Tomasoni, and I do believe that Senator Bach will be presenting the bill. Welcome to the committee, Senator Bach. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm sorry if I was holding up the committee. I was down in 1200 with the HHS committee, and. Uh, I'm more comfortable in the Environment Committee than I am at HHS. That's kind of outside of my wheelhouse. Uh, Senator Bach, you're right on time, so welcome. But Madam Chair, you'd, en you'd enjoy the bill I had over there. I'm trying to help Ma and Pa resorts. Uh, yes, there's a, there's love a it. Department of Health issue around hot tubs in single standalone cabins. So it was a, it was a good hearing. Uh, Madam Chair, this bill is a Thomasoni bill uh, that is intended to put some transparency into the state's environmental permitting process for large industrial projects. Uh, oftentimes, a proposer of a project uh, applies for a permit and we just don't know what happens, right? And there just are no kind of timelines. We don't know how many permits are gonna be required, uh, what the, how long the scoping process will take and you know, trying to figure out what the, uh, what we need to look at for in, an environmental impact statement. And uh, I should just remind everybody that when these large projects come forward, that EIS that's then developed, which is where uh, most of the cost is in, in obtaining a permit to construct a project, that's actually paid for by the project proposer. Uh, and I think sometimes I think... Uh, people out on the street forget that, that we're not subsidizing these large companies that want to do these projects. They're actually paying their way. They're paying for the cost of doing all the environmental review process. And it just seems like there should be some kind of transparent process where all of us, them as, as project proposers uh, and, and the general public to know 
how's the project progressing in a, in, a, in a timeline. So it really doesn't change any of the environmental review that's required at all. It just tries to create uh, a dashboard uh, where we can all monitor the progress uh, that, a, that a project is going through. And it's interesting, Madam Chair, that back during the Obama administration, uh, because the federal government realized that their whole environmental process for, for building out public highway infrastructure was too cumbersome, they created a fast track process, the federal government did, for uh, their large infrastructure projects that we do around the country uh, with a dashboard with the very kind of thing that we're proposing here for private projects in Minnesota. And in addition to the, to the transportation projects that were originally proposed in the, uh, uh, the federal transportation bill, uh, the federal government just recently added mining projects from a federal perspective to use that same kind of a dashboard. So this really kind of gets Minnesota in line with uh, the way the federal government is working to try and streamline and add some, uh, some transparency to the process. Uh, hopefully projects, it just seems like they shouldn't have to take decades to get permitted. And I think some of that, you know, some of what we're currently going through is attributable to COVID. There's no question about that, but, uh, a, a process where everybody out in the public can can see what the departments are going to be looking at and and a timeline of how long thing we expect things to take is uh, important. And the, the DNR had some concerns with the bill when we heard it in Senator Eichhorn's committee, and I was very public in telling them I look forward to making to that whatever we pass works for them. And I mean it needs to work for the department. I understand that. And if some of the timelines in the bill are are problematic for them. I look forward to uh, the kind of modification so that we can make this work. But uh, the process right now from where I live up north, it seems to be pretty broken and, and we, we can't follow along with how things are going. So with that, Madam Chair, I've got some testifiers here that want the opportunity to testify to the bill. Thank you, Senator Bach. Uh, first up, we have Jason George. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and uh, proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Jason George. I'm the business manager and elected leader of the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49. Uh, we have over 14,000 members, several thousand of whom live in Northeast Minnesota, the area we're talking about today. Uh, and live and work in the area and, and make a good living, uh, helping support the mines up there too. Um, I'll let others talk to the technical aspects of the bill that are much more intelligent than I about those rules and laws, but I, I'm here mostly to talk about the frustration that we have as a, as a construction union that builds projects and the, the permitting process that's in place and some of the challenges that we've had with it. Um, I think Senator Bach is correct uh, in stating that our process is a little bit broken. Um, it's it's in taking entirely too long to get decisions on projects. Uh, we've seen projects get approved and then lawsuits come and they, they lose their permits, they get them back, uh, 17 years of that kind of thing. We've seen a project submit a mining proposal and, and the proposal was stuck in a drawer and never even gave given the time of day, uh, which is just completely unacceptable to us. Um, we support uh, keeping the standards in place and strong standards that we have in Minnesota, we will not support projects that do not meet those standards. This is not about short circuiting or, or um, cutting corners. It's about creating certainty. And every business in the state and in America will tell you they need certainty in permitting procedures to gain investment to build here. And we don't have it right now. So I encourage you all to act and support Senator Thomas Tony's bill 2797. I want to thank Senator Thomas only for bringing it forward. Um, there are thousands and thousands of jobs at stake. There's a whole generation of mining up on the range that's needed for our national security to provide the minerals we need for electric vehicles. And we can't afford to have a broken permitting process uh, hold us back. So look forward to you all taking action on this and supporting Senator Thomas only's bill. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And next we have Brian Hansen. Welcome to the committee. And maybe Mr. Quillis, you'd like to come up at the same time here. Thank you. 
Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Rood and members. My name is Brian Hansen, and I'm honored to be speaking to you today as board chair of Jobs for Minnesotans. We're a unique nonpartisan coalition that brings together labor unions, business community, and local communities. We represent over 70,000 members of the building trades, over 2,300 members of the Minnesota Chamber, the 500,000 people that work for them, and hundreds more local chamber members, mayors, and residents of the state. Together, we founded this coalition in 2012 to support statewide opportunities for prosperity and advance middle-class jobs through responsible industrial projects. As a coalition, we've consistently advocated for policies that create a fair regulatory process for the government, for the public agencies, and fair to the investors alike. The three pillars of a fair process are transparency, predictability, and timeliness. Without any of these three, the regulatory process loses credibility and fairness for projects being reviewed in our state. Minnesota has been earning a worse and worse reputation for responsible industrial projects, including non-ferrous minerals development. Unfortunately, it's very understandable. Currently, there is no reliability, reliable accountability mechanism in place to encourage state agencies to advance the review of a proposed project in a timely and fair manner. Couple that with the high stakes games being played at the federal level with proposed mining moratoriums, unjustified pulling of minerals leases, and it just gets worse. The situation should be especially important to members of this policy committee. It needs your attention. We've watched several mining pro proposal projects. Timelines get moved to the right time after time, creating an unpredictable regulatory environment. The impact on investment in our state is chilling. This is particularly harmful in greater Minnesota, where new investment is desperately needed. As we've seen, agencies have significant power to stall the advancement of the regulatory process for proposed mining projects. And Jason provided just a couple of examples. Sometimes with the lack of any other rational justification, these tactics appear to be politically motivated. If approved through the existing thorough science-based review and permitting processes, these important projects could bring thousands of jobs to our communities and mineral independence to our country especially at a time when recent events have proved we need domestic control over some of our resources. It's clear that the public deserves more transparency on both the proposer and regulator sides for our process here in Minnesota to be fair. We need set parameters for transparency and predictability with timelines, a keystone of our regulatory framework. Jobs for Minnesotans is proud to support this act that aims to help these projects move at the speed of business and improve transparency. This act is modeled after the Federal Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, as Senator Bach talked about. It was signed into law by President Obama in 2015, and we require state agencies to establish procedures and deadlines for completing environmental review and permits for metallic mining projects. We especially support the creation of a public dashboard as a tool for the agencies, the project proposers, and the public to track the environmental review and permitting processes. That's what our coalition has been advocating for all along. Through this act, the regulatory processes for mining projects will demonstrate the credibility that we believed in. Mining has been the lifeblood of Northeast Minnesota for over 130 years, supporting workers and communities with safe family sustaining jobs. It's existed in harmony with our co other core industries, including forest products, transportation, healthcare, education, and tourism. It has existed all while protecting the environment. We need to allow mining investors the opportunity to demonstrate they can both safely mine for minerals and protect the surrounding environment. This act will go a long way in helping to achieve just that. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Mr. Quillis, welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Tony Quillis, and I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for allowing me to make a couple of brief comments on Senate File 2797. Madam Chair, members, it is no secret that there are some challenges in our environmental permitting and environmental review process here in Minnesota. 
Minnesota businesses have expressed frustration and concern about the uncertainty and variability in the environmental review and environmental permitting process. When my phone rings from our members who are looking to either locate here or expand a facility here, the three things that come up all the time are the time, the cost, and the uncertainty of the process here in Minnesota. Madam Chair, just recently I listened to a uh, site selector presentation and the site selectors work for either individual companies or they work as consultants with companies looking to uh, locate or expand outside uh, in the United States arena. And they interviewed all the people that located where they were and other um, folks that didn't locate where they were and they asked them um, to rank why they located and there's taxes and weather we're never going to be over as nice as it was this weekend we're never going to be able to overcome that here in Minnesota. But when they asked them about Minnesota, um, one of the things they said was the environmental review and environmental permitting process, and some of the words they used to describe the process were strict complex unclear and not business friendly and the presenter said I hate to use this word but oppressive for the environmental review and environmental permitting process here in Minnesota. And I'll give you one example, Madam Chair. There's a facility that was looking to locate up in Northern Minnesota, 50 jobs, 100, $150 million investment here. And that facility now is located in North Dakota. And when they went over and interviewed them and asked them, why did you locate in North Dakota? Their number one reason, the environmental review and environmental permitting process in Minnesota took too long, cost too much, and the uncertainty of it. Madam Chair, one final thought is, um, you know, we must protect the environment and natural resources of the state of Minnesota. That is the number one priority. We're blessed with Lake Superior, two national parks, 10,000 plus lakes, and a park and trail system that is the envy of many other states. But I think that we can do that while fostering a healthy business climate that adds certainty, clarity, and transparency to the environmental permitting and environmental review process. And I think Senate file um, 2797 is a step in that direction, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Next we have uh, Christy Bartovich and she is remote today. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Chrissy Barnovich. I'm the Environmental Director for U.S. Steel's two mining facilities, Mintac and Keechak in northern Minnesota. We employ over 1,800 people who work 365 days a year to produce taconite pellets, which are made into steel. I'm a third-generation miner, a lifelong resident of northeastern Minnesota, and a 22-year employee of U.S. Steel. I'm here today to express our support for Senate File 2797. As a member of the Iron Range community and a parent to three school-aged children, I see firsthand the support the mining industry provides to the region and education throughout the state. U.S. Steel is the largest contributor to the Minnesota School Trust with approximately $250 million in the last 10 years. In addition to that, we provided over 50 million to the University Trust, donated over 40 acres of land to the Nashua Keewatin School District for a new school location, and contributed $300,000 to the Rock Ridge School District for the construction of their school. As we sit today, U.S. Steel does not have a project subject to the proposed legislation, but I hope that we will in the future as our business continues to thrive in Minnesota. As a part of my job, I'm also involved in U.S. Steel sustainability efforts. As a company, we have pledged a 20% reduction by 2030 and going to net zero by 2050. While these are aggressive goals that we spend significant time on, Sustainability is much larger than just greenhouse gases. A foundational aspect of sustainability is transparency. Much like the public and shareholders expect transparency from business, we also need that same level of transparency from our regulators. A comprehensive plan determining how environmental review will be conducted, including schedules, is critical for transparency. As a regulated party, we also need certainty and predictability in schedules to properly plan capital allocations and other resources. In addition to working in Minnesota, I have responsibility for facilities in other jurisdictions in the United States. I've experienced agency permitting, which was efficient yet tough. Just one example for our company is the recent work in the state of Arkansas to permit a new steel making facility. The permitting effort was completed methodically with an over 600 page air permit issued in January 31st, 2022, which was applied for in September of 2021. 
Although this was in another state, this permit met the Minnesota permitting goal of 180 days. We support this bill as it will create predictability and timeliness for large projects. Thank you for the opportunity to provide some comments today and for the work of this committee. Thank you. Next we have Dean DeBelts. Welcome. Please state your name and proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dean DeBelts. I'm the Director of Operations and Safety at Twin Metals, Minnesota. I'm a fourth generation miner and I promote and respect the advancement our industry has made to ensure safety and envir environmental stewardship. I'm a lifelong ranger in Eliade and an avid visitor to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. In fact, you can see it out my door. And that's one of the reasons I joined Twin Metals, Minnesota 10 years ago. Twin Metals, Minnesota is made up of Minnesotans who live, work and raise families locally in our communities. We're poised to be a global leader in underground copper, nickel, cobalt and platinum group metals mining. We're located near the cities of Ely and Babbitt, and we and our predecessor companies have held leases in good standing for over 50 years. To date, there has been a private investment of over $530 million in exploration, engineering, and environmental studies. We've drilled over 2 million feet of core to better understand the subsurface geology of our deposit and installed over 100 hydrogeologic wells to scientifically study water movement, both surface and subsurface. We're committed to becoming a model for future mining in our state by providing long-term family sustaining jobs, being a supporter of our communities and youth in our region, by providing important contributions to the public school trust fund and committed to environmentally responsible economic development in our region. The environmental review process is currently painstakingly slow and the lack of certainty of process to bring a mine project to fruition deters investment in our state, the state of Minnesota. The process should be grounded in science and facts and transparent so that everyone understands and can be assured of a fair regulatory process. We have spent over a decade dedicated to studies to put forward the correct operation for our siting, which resulted in our submittal of a mine plan for environmental, environmental scoping in 2019. Our submittal was smaller, more sustainable, and a more efficient mine plan. The plan was designed with proven environmental protection measures. Because 80% of our mining happens 1,500 feet below surface, the location of our minerals requires modern underground methods and techniques. We target valuable minerals. No waste materials will be brought to surface, which eliminates the potential for acid rock drainage. We've listened to stakeholders and adopted the dry stack storage um, for tailings, which means no tailings basin, no dam, and no potential for dam failure. Some of the project enhancements of the Twin Metals project, we're on track to be a net zero operation. We've announced the utilization of a battery electric fleet to minimize emissions and enhance worker safety. We'll source renewable energy providers. We'll recover heat from our mine ventilation and we're advancing research on carbon sequestration and our tailings, both passive and active. Domestic sourcing of these critical minerals addresses pressing public policy issues. Water, coffee. Mm -hmm. Climate change, um, domestically sourcing these minerals is necessary to fuel a path to a greener economy. These strategic minerals bolster our national security and we can shore up our domestic supply chains and become less um, reliant on adversarial countries, all while creating American jobs here in the North Star State. We at Twin Metals are steadfast in our commitment to advancing our model underground mine. We're dedicated to, the, to bring much needed economic growth to our region. We're committed to the communities of Northeastern Minnesota, and we will responsibly develop a domestic source of minerals 
critical to our future. We thank Senators Thomasoni and Bach for their support of this bill, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Frank Angaro. He is remote. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Frank Angaro. I'm Executive Director of Mining Minnesota, representing the non-ferrous industry in the state. On behalf of the industry, I want to thank Senator Thomasoni, Senator Eichhorn, and Senator Bach for bringing the bill forward, and you, Madam Chair, uh, for hearing this bill today. Uh, I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 2797. We believe a discussion on how environmental review and permitting uh, can be improved in the state is important for all industries to have, uh, even though this bill is specific to mining. Uh, you know, Minnesota is staring at a tremendous opportunity to be a world leader in developing critical minerals uh, essential for clean energy and to address climate change. Uh, across the board, for electric vehicles, for wind turbines, for solar, we simply need more mining. And we are import dependent on all the metals that are needed for this clean economy. Fortunately in Minnesota, we have a significant percentage of the total US domestic resource of critical minerals like nickel and cobalt. And because of this, we are seeing tremendous investment coming into the state of Minnesota from all across the planet. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of at-risk capital coming here, looking at the opportunity to invest in shoring up our critical mineral for our domestic supply chain. The best thing that the state of Minnesota can do to continue to attract that investment is provide as much certainty, as much transparency, and as much timeliness as possible in the environmental review and permitting process. We believe that this bill helps to improve that transparency, that certainty, and that timeliness. Uh, we're fortunate in the state of Minnesota to have a comprehensive science-based environmental review and permitting process, but that can always be improved. And the tenets of this bill and the principles within it uh, as Senator Bach mentioned, are not new. The Obama administration uh, proposed uh, many of these tenants in its Fast 41 initiative to speed up infrastructure projects. And now the Biden administration is proposing a number of these principles in its fundamental principles of domestic mining reform. Uh, a few of the points uh, in those uh, reform principles, uh, number seven is to provide permitting certainty and to improve interagency cooperation done in concert with proponents, local governments, tribal nations to improve permitting timelines. And using transparency, such as the project permitting dashboard to provide real-time certainty for propon proponents, agencies, and the public. Uh, specifically, uh, the dashboard uh, reference in section three of the Biden principle is something that the agencies use similarly in the PolyMet proposal and started to use in the Twin Metals proposal. Uh, we heard some reference to uh, that being supported by certain environmental groups. So we thank them for uh, referencing that uh, at the last hearing, uh, an important piece of something that we believe that can really be helpful in the permitting process. Some other areas uh, of the principles uh, that uh, come forward from the Biden administration uh, that are transferable to the state of Minnesota is the priority on recycling. We fully believe that more recycling can, should be done and promoted all across the board. But make no mistake, you can recycle every opportunity across the planet for all of the metals and it will come nowhere to meet the demand of current and future need for these metals for nickel, for copper, for cobalt, and for platinum group metals. We simply will need more mining. Also, uh, the proposal from the Biden administration speaks to conducting comprehensive planning. Uh, this bill uh, looks at um, what should be done 
and clearly states that it does not in any way circumvent, repeal, or weaken any standards and provides the agencies with the continued authority to, if a project demonstrates it can meet all standards to move forward, if it cannot demonstrate that it can meet all standards, the agency can continue to say no and stop a project. Uh, there's additional specifics to uh, protecting special places in the Biden administration proposal. This bill does not in any way impact state agencies' power to properly regulate mining projects and does not in any way encourage agencies to approve projects where pollution prevention and mitigation are not possible. Uh, finally, uh, Madam Chair, um, well, again, this bill uh, is specific to mining. Uh, we believe all industries could benefit from this improved certainty, timeliness, and transparency. Uh, we urge the committee to support uh, this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Joe Henderson from the DNR. Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, my name is Joe Henderson. I am the division director for the Division of Lands and Minerals at the Minnesota DNR. The DNR places significant emphasis on transparency, which benefits both project proposers and interested stakeholders. For these large projects, we employ planning tools that include anticipated schedules, identification of milestones, and finding critical paths that accomplish the most important steps in the process. We do use websites, dashboards, and other communication tools to post documents and share updates. We meet routinely with other agencies to communicate, coordinate, and identify potential issues and plan to accomplish milestones. We meet routinely and frequently with project proposers. In reviewing this bill, the DNR has identified several areas that are problematic in its current draft. A dashboard that can be utilized by other entities would need to be custom built and would be very expensive. Short timeframes may lead to posting a proposer's data that is preliminary, not public, and not in an accessible format. These timelines may lead to an inability to coordinate with other state or federal agencies or consult with tribal governments. Bypassing or shortening these steps would circumvent the process to reduce opportunities for input which could be detrimental to the project. The DNR is uncertain on due dates for some of the requirements. The DNR is also uncertain on the numerous references to deadlines and whether those are environmental review deadlines under rule or deadlines imposed by this bill. The DNR commissioner appears to be given new authority to impose requirements on other agencies and direct their work. Without new funding for this work, existing staff would be pulled away from environmental review and permitting work to accomplish these tasks. The prescriptive detailed requirements will make this difficult to implement and may extend project timelines. We are drafting a fiscal note for this bill. There will be considerable costs to create a tool to facilitate a multi-agency dashboard, as well as costs for staff time to implement these requirements for each metallic mineral project with environmental review. In these types of projects, complexities and unique situations need to be taken into account. The inability to do so would be detrimental to each project. We strive to operate in an efficient manner, employ best practices, and refine processes to continually improve, but we need to take the time to get it done right with sound science and full compliance with the law. Thank you for considering these comments. I will stand for questions. Thank you. Uh, and Senator Bach, we have uh, one more testifier that's not on the list. Uh, Senator Tom Sony has indicated he would like to uh, add a couple words here. Thanks, Madam Chair and committee members. The permitting process in Minnesota is basically broken when it comes to big projects. There needs to be certainty and time frames so not only can companies plan their budgets and their future, but agencies will know how many resources to commit and what will be the expectations of them. That is reasonable and responsible. We are a mineral rich state, minerals that are badly needed in our new age economy and they must be mined. No more can permitting take 15 years. 
there is virtually nothing about mining that we don't already know, so this delay mentality has to stop. We can't be at a competitive disadvantage to the point that another state can permit something in six months and we can't do it in five years. This is a reasonable bill. Madam Chair and committee members, thank you for hearing this bill and I ask for your support and thanks to Senator Bach for presenting the bill. Thank you. And I think the only thing missing from that was it's a good vote bill, vote for it. <laughs> um, thank you, Senator Bach. Um, members, are there uh, questions? Senator Lang, yes, is it okay? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess Senator Bach, and this is, you know, as we go forward, I think any transparency in, a, in an agency is a good thing. Um, I'm curious, and this may be for the, the uh, department more than it is for you, but I'm curious as to the process now as it goes forward. I, I know I'm a, a flat planer from Southwest Minnesota that, uh, doesn't know a whole lot about mining, but uh, how long does the process take now on average? Senator Bach. Well, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, the department can probably speak uh, more to this than I can, but uh, I have seen in my time here, so many natural resource type projects get away from us. Uh, I've seen agricultural processing facilities end up in Iowa or South Dakota or North Dakota. <clears throat> And what, what was very heartbreaking to me was when I was over at the governor's residence with Governor Dayton and the CEO of Cleveland Cliffs, who's one of the biggest steel producers in the country and they operate four mines uh, and own part of another one in Northern Minnesota. And they wanted to build a value added hot rocketed iron facility in Northern Minnesota, about a $700 million project to add some value to Minnesota's iron ore before it's shipped to the lower Great Lakes. And the CEO asked the governor, and I was sitting there at the table. He said, governor, how long, I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna build a HBI plant. How long will it take me to get permits in Minnesota? Members, you know what? Governor Dayton couldn't answer. Couldn't give him an answer. And the CEO then said, the governor of Ohio guaranteed me that I'll have environmental permits to build my plant in six months. And the plant ended up in Ohio. And, and it's, in fact, it's done with construction now. I, I, I just think, you know, in rural Minnesota, the real opportunity we have for economic development for livable wage jobs is adding value to the natural resources that we have. We're just too far away from everything uh, to think we're gonna hit some home run and attract some company to a rural area without, that's not somehow connected to natural resources. And especially in the mining area, we are on the cusp of huge development of, of Minnesota's natural resources. As the world moves to renewable energy, uh, the, the demand for these metals is gonna be exponentially from where it is today. I was just listening to uh, NPR this morning on my way in and they were having a conversation about the price of nickel right now. And you know, we can't make, we don't, we don't produce any nickel or almost zero in this country. And they were talking about the fact that since the Ukrainian war started, the price of nickel has gone up by 130% in the last month. Something similar is happening with palladium. Uh, and I just, I just find it unconscionable that we as a, as a country think it's okay to exploit other countries and their people around the world with no environmental regulations, no labor laws. And, and then we, we export from those kind of places and uh, we benefit from the struggles of others around the world when we have those resources right here in Minnesota to, and, and this doesn't, and, and, and let me just say that it doesn't change the environmental review process, but the frustration, Senator Lang, for example, let me just say of the Walls administration, 
they have been asked a number of times and to the to the department's comment about this tells the lead agency the dnr that other commissioners basically have to cooperate and, and move in conjunction with the lead permitting agency uh, that's a real challenge and in, in the walls administration people have asked for three years now for the walls administration to create a sub cabinet on mining sub cabinet number of governors before governor dayton had one governor plenty had one i think it might have been governor carlson that started it uh, so that there because mining as important as mining is to this state that there is a forum where the commissioners of all the different state departments can get together and network and talk to each other about what is going on in this in this significant industry in our state and so far today at least it's fallen on deaf ears at the Walls administration. For probably for the first time in all my years here, this governor's decided not to have a sub cabinet on mining. And I, I'm, I'm disappointed by that. All of us that serve on the IRRRB board up in Northern Minnesota are disappointed by that. And uh, so there's, there, there's some of the problem just is people in state government aren't talking to each other. and. I mean, and at DNR, there's there's major challenges over there. That's a tough. That, I would argue that's probably the toughest commissioner job in state government, because there are all of these silos. You know, the fish and wildlife people are in a silo. The waters people are in a silo. The ecological services are in a silo, and there's not enough communication between even in the own department with each other. And I think a number of us have tried over the years to try and see if we can get uh, all those different departments or divisions inside the department to work more cooperatively that's a real challenge and then when you when you take it to other agencies outside of the dnr who's the lead on these kind of projects if we can't figure out how to do it inside the the, the dnr how do we expect other agencies are going to cooperate and, and they just need to be told to by the legislature that these projects are important and we need everyone across state government working together on them because you know senator lang we're in the 17th year now of permitting for polymet. Now, and some of that is, be, is clearly because of uh, all of the legal challenges that have been brought forward on it. Uh, and we're not, we're not over those hurdles yet. And that's why there's nothing in this bill that expedites anything, that shortcuts anything. Because if you do that, at the end of the day, you answer anything. Because if you do that, at the end of the day, you end up in court and you just drag your project out that much further. So. We're not at all in any way proposing that we shortcut any of the environmental review process. Just give us some kind of certainty about what a timeline is uh, so that all of us, uh, whether the, it's people that support the project or people that don't support the project, know kind of what's going on with, with this project that some, some private people want to develop. And uh, I just, I just don't think it's unreasonable. And also I said in the earlier committee, I, I'll say it again, uh, things that are worth doing, sometimes they cost money. And I guess that'll be up to Senator Ingbertson to find out you know, what, what ultimately the cost is uh, internally for the department. I can't imagine they're gonna hire new FTEs. Uh, so if they're not gonna do that, there's some cost shifting going on uh, in, uh, uh, between other department employees that are tasked with different work. So I don't know that that's overall, a, if they don't add FTEs, I don't I hard to have a hard time to seeing where it costs anything if we're just moving people from doing one bit of work to another. But anyway, if it, if it costs money, that'll be up to Senator Egbertson, I guess, to figure out how, how, we, how we get there. But I absolutely welcome the, where the department thinks there's deficiencies in this bill to make it work. You know, I said it in the earlier committee, I'll say it again, tell us what they are, tell us what here doesn't work, but don't just tell us, oh, we can't do this. And, and, and I don't think they have done that, but I'm looking, looking forward to some suggestions about where they think there are problems so that we can bring some additional transparency and accountability to this, this permitting process. Because in, uh, like I say, in, in rural Minnesota, the, the opportunity for for new economic activity doesn't come along very often. And most of it is connected to natural resources, whether it's in agriculture or forestry or wood products or, or, or minerals. Uh, we're just not gonna get home runs in other areas. 
but these are uh, in very, very important projects to our state. I would argue to our country. Uh, you can imagine, I, I can't imagine, you know, there's, I don't know how, I, I don't know how we're gonna develop the electric car industry that most of us want to develop without the minerals to, to make the batteries. The lithium, the cobalt, the nickel. I mean, we're not gonna make the batteries without it. And I, I think not, a, not enough is being done on that front uh, to acknowledge that, you know, General Motors can turn out a car, but if there's not a battery to run it, because we don't have the, 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 the metals that are needed, it, it'll, it might make us feel good that we see a bunch of cars on the lot, but no one's gonna drive them away without a battery in them. And, and I support the idea of renewable energy. I support the idea of, 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 of moving to electric, electrification in our economy, but it's gonna take metals and it's gonna take a lot of metals. And I don't want them to come from Chile or Bolivia or the Congo or China or Russia when, we when we're sitting on them right here in our own state. And I just will say in, in, is, you know, we've been mining a long time in Northern Minnesota. We started in my district in 1881, 142 years. And wanna remind everybody the cleanest water and the cleanest air in Minnesota is right there where all this mining has been taking place. And nobody, nobody wants that water clean and the air cleaner than the people that live there. And uh, we will do our part to hold these companies to the kind of standards so that we can maintain that for ourselves and for our kids and for our grandchildren. But uh, there's a tremendous opportunity if we don't let it slip away, but it's going to happen someplace uh, because the world needs the metals. And all we're saying is let's create a transparent process so that companies will look at investment in, in Minnesota so they know what the what, kind of what the ground rules are. And if it turns out it's 17 years, it's 17 years. But if we can get it to 10 uh, with some certainty, that would be, uh, I think, a, a good thing. Long answer, Senator Lang. <laughs> uh, Mr. Henderson, I know you sat at the table. Do you care to make comment? Madam Chair, Senator Lang, as far as I think the question was average, when you have a few data points, an average is really challenging, right? So we can look at PolyMet, which took far too long, and we can talk about why that was. And, and I think, you know, at the core of that issue is um, a company doing work on developing or refining its project while it's in environmental review, right? Um, that shouldn't be the case. You should have your project developed and refined when you come into environmental review so you don't have to reconfigure as you go. And so, um, you know, I think the permitting timeline was, was much more efficient on PolyMet. Um, the environmental review timeline took a long time for a reason. Uh, again, having other, lacking many other data points, it's, it would be very challenging to give you an average. When you have one of these projects that starts each year between environmental review or, or an EIS, which we don't even have one a year, um, I don't know that that number would be meaningful. They're very specific to the site, to the project, uh, underground mines versus open pit mines, uh, expansions versus new pits and new mines. I'm sorry, I don't have an average for you. Senator Lang. Well, th thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Bach. Uh, you have a uncanny ability to answer all my questions that I had lined up prior to me asking them, but. Um, I guess really the only other one is, is, is time limit, you know, and it seems to me as, as Mr. Quillis had talked earlier, he gave a couple of qualifiers and the one that stuck in my mind was strict. I don't have a problem with strict so much. I think that's maybe a, a good thing, uh, but somewhere between strict and 17 years, I think is a compromise where we as a state can come together and try to figure out how to get these projects permitted in a, in a, a fashion that's has some sort of flow. Um, I, I guess as of right now, they're, they're, and I guess you don't need to answer this question. You can just nod your head in agreement, but I'm assuming there's no time limit for EAW, EIW right now, correct? Mr. Henderson? Madam Chair, Senator Lang, that is correct. Um, it's 
data-driven, science-based mm -hmm. uh, decisions. And if um, the project does not meet the requirements, uh, it will not be approved. Senator Lang. So I guess the, the answer to the question is that if you have a department that can hold up a permit process indefinitely in the process without either denying or approving it, I think we sort of have a problem that hopefully this bill goes to address. So with that, Madam Chair, that's all I have. Members, are there other questions? Senator McEwen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is, is sort of a follow-up to, uh, to my colleague. Um, I, I, it seems to me that this time limit question is, is sort of a double-edged sword because um, as, as you described, there's um, you know, various reasons for why um, a timeline um, might an extension might be wanted um, also by a proposer of uh, a project. So they may um, assess what they've presented and really see that what they put together or the way that things are going, they are concerned that, that the way it is right now, it won't be permitted, it won't be approved. And then they need that time in order to be able to make changes and adjustments to their proposed project. Is, is that one of the, the reasons? Is, did I hear you correctly that that's one of the reasons why um, there can be what people would consider delays or longer periods of time needed for the consideration of these permits? Thank you. Who would like that, Mr. Henderson or Ms. Senator Bach? I can respond to that. Mr. Damn Henderson. Chair. Um, you are correct, um, and to Senator Lang's point too, proposers often would rather work on their project to make it permittable than have us deny their environmental review or permit request. Senator McEwen. Uh, Senator Bach, I, I, um, I know we've talked about this before and I've talked about it often with, with Senator Tomasoni that um, my family um, comes from Hibbing and my grandparents are in the cemetery up in Hibbing and I make that annual trip every year to go uh, on Memorial Day. And my, my father worked in the mines in the early to mid 1930s. And so the tradition of mining is an amazing one. And it put him through college, the University of Minnesota and afforded him um, great opportunities. And uh, the family home is still up there on First Street in Hibbing. It came on a Sears Roebuck out of a Sears robot catalog and a flatbed train. And uh, it's wonderful. I think um, the poor people that live there now, it's a beautiful little home, but they have a picture of every grandchild running up on the front step and hurry up, take a picture. There's, you know, great grandpa's house. And so I, I think the traditions of the range are amazing. And uh, we need to keep them that. And mining is such an important part and when you talk about the clean water, there is no more clean water than when you go up there. It's, it's amazing. It reminds me of the uh, Cuyuna mine pits. And the Cuyuna mine pits are now an amazing resource in that little town of Crosby. Mm -hmm. And the water is so clean and so deep and so clear. And they mine that whole area. And right now we're kayaking and scuba diving in that clean, deep, clear water. So it can be done. I like this bill that it gives the transparency. I think that's what's been missing in the permitting process. We all wanna see how it's going and where it's going and what they're doing. And I think when we answer those questions and people have the truth about the whole process and are satisfied, um, regardless of what side of the issue, I think it helps us move forward. So um, I thank you, uh, Senator Tomasoni and Senator Bach for bringing this bill forward today. With that, members? Oh, Senator Sengem. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just, I, I just want to understand uh, the DNR's position on this just a little bit more. And, and I understand that you offered, and I don't recall them all, uh, several, you know, uh, don't kind of like this part or that part. Of, but, but generally speaking, is not, is not the bill something that DNR, at least philosophically, the direction of the bill could support? Mr. You know, Henderson. Work, working out the you know, the finer details. I mean, this, this is something I think we all want is transparency you know, and permitting. And, uh, and as I go through it, I, I, I think not, nothing but positives in it. 
you know, there's some, you know, deadlines and so on and so forth. That's massageable, but it is not the direction of the bill, the intent, the philosophical intent of the bill. Would you not agree that's a good one? Mr. Henderson. Senator Senjum, Madam Chair. Um, I think that the DNR does much of the work that's described in this bill already with the dashboards, with, you know, cooperation, with meetings. Um, we do uh, drive to be transparent and, and inclusive in our meetings. I think one of the biggest concerns is, is rushing, rushing things and, and, and putting timelines on the DNR. Um, we will submit a fiscal note. Um, I, I would argue that um, additional resources would greatly affect our ability to, to work with this bill. Uh, but absent those resources, it's going to then take all other projects, not just environmental review projects. It's the same staff that work on environmental review and permit that work on amendments and other things too. And so every single project uh, would get dragged out into a much, much longer timeline unless we have the additional resources. So there's a concern about resources and there's just a concern about um, ensuring that we do involve other agencies and, and uh, tribal nations and others and, and uh, continue to, to have the transparent processes that we have right now. Senator okay. Senjum. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I would just say, I mean, Senator Bach has beautifully, I think, articulated the, the potential of the range. And, 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 the, and the need for the world right now and with respect to a renewable energy future uh, needing these, these minerals. Uh, I mean, we hear, I hear a lot because I'm sort of in this arena, you know, digging out the, the nickel in the Congo. Well, you know, that, that's a kind of a painful thing. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we, can, we can do this. Uh, we can do this in Minnesota. We ought to do it in Minnesota. It, it's it's the great big uh, new you know economic renaissance as far as I'm concerned and and we we can do it well I mean good grief I mean engineering controls we've got some of the best technological people in the world right here in Minnesota and we can we can figure out the the pollution prevention parts of this that that's that's easy but we have to have the will to do it and I would just say if it means uh, you know more money in Senator Ingerbitson's portfolio if you will to get this done. My goodness sakes, it will pay off 10,000 times uh, over in terms of uh, a new and, uh, and needed industry in Northern Minnesota. And, uh, uh, so I, I strongly support uh, the direction of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanna comment, uh, uh, Mr. Henderson made a statement about uh, the fact that their people are involved in a whole variety of, of things. and. And I've been actually visiting recently with the uh, commissioner of MPCA as it relates to um, an EAW for uh, a hog finishing operation in my district. Um, they lost it by with fire last uh, last about a year ago. Made an application for with an EAW for uh, uh, in June of last year, and they, as of two weeks ago, it still hadn't been put out for thirty day public notice on the UQB. Um, you know, actually, one of the reasons they have given me for the delay was the fact, well, the DNR needed to weigh in on the Topeka Shiner. Uh, quite frankly, a hog finishing operation that has no discharge into the waters of Minnesota. The, the land on which the manure would be knifed in is the same land that they've always knifed it in. Um, Part of the problem is I think your agency tends to have some make work items there that they don't really need to do, um, Mr. Henderson. And um, I just uh, find uh, ever since I've been here, we've been told about this great level of cooperation between the agencies. However, we never seem to see it. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to support this bill. I think we all should. Um, as to whether it actually makes a difference between with our agencies cooperation with one another, um, you know, I'm not gonna bet money on it, um, but um, uh, I think we need to do it. And with that, Madam Chair, I request a roll call vote. 
Roll call vote has been requested. A roll call vote will be, will be granted. Are there other um, comments? Senator Herr. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Bob, and also Senator Thomasoni um, for testifying, and your voice is heard more naturally, you know, as we go day to day. So happy to hear that. You know, I, um, I hear the frustration, you know, um, especially even my personal experience or represent, you know, district that are not are underrepresented, you know, 21 change, sometimes bureaucracy delayed us and I can understand that point. Um, and so, but at the same time, you know, uh, someone um, the testified to bring up the uh, Biden and Harris administration, the mining reform principle. And there's a number of items in addition to this one. And so, it seems like we're chair picking or if we want to move forward, can we move forward with all of them instead of uh, chair picking? So I just want to make a comment uh, regarding this uh, before we make a roll call. Thank, Thank you. you. And Senator Bach, final comments? No, Madam Chair, I think we've, we've exhausted the issue except to say that I got a, I, and I made this speech in Senator Eichhorn's committee about where things come from. And I think we all should remember that if it's not growing or mined, it doesn't exist on the planet. That's it. And I, I think we're forgetting that. So I, uh, a lobbyist friend of mine who's retired, because I said kind of in my closing remarks to the committee, you know, when you put your milk on your kid's cereal in the morning, ask them where it came from. And if they say cub foods, tell them it came from a cow. And so the, a, a lobbyist, uh, uh, emailed me this weekend and said, you know, we babysit for our, for our grandkids and my little two and a half year old granddaughter takes a nap during the day. So when I put her down for her nap and gave her her bottle, I asked her where the milk came from. And she said, the fridge. <laughs> he said, so I have some work to do with my, in my own family. But I, I do think we all, we don't, we don't think enough about that as, as a society anymore. We just kind of assume things that we want are going to be there. I mean, we're going to build electric cars because we all think it's a good idea, but where is everything, the components going to come from, right? Uh, so that's really what this is about. Let's, uh, there's a tremendous opportunity in the whole renewable industry. Uh, and uh, there's especially a lot of opportunity for Minnesota in that. And I, I don't think we should miss that because these uh, you know, we happen to have the ore body here that, that has the resources that the world needs. Uh, at, at some point, these big global companies, and that's who does mining around the globe, uh, they're going to find a different place to do it. You know, it's probably not going to be in Russia in the, in the near future, but someday it will be again because we'll have short memories about what happened in Ukraine, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, Minnesota is on the cusp of making a significant contribution to the the whole uh, renewable energy climate change economy. And I just, just like we change the health of the world with our medical device industry, we have an opportunity to participate in a similar way, uh, moving the country uh, towards mitigating the impacts of climate change. And wouldn't it be great for Minnesota to be on the cutting edge of that? So making our process a little more transparent so we all know what's going on. I, I think it's kind of hard to say that that's not a good idea asking state agencies to work together uh, when, when a project is proposed. I don't understand why that's not a good idea. Uh, so Madam Chair, that's all Senator Thomasoni and I have to, to, to relay to you. We, uh, and I know he'd, he'd love to be here and I wish, I wish he was sitting here instead of me, but he's not. So Madam Chair, that's, that's all I have for today. Thank you, Senator Bach and Senator Thomasoni. Senator Weber, would you like to make the motion to move the bill to Environment Finance Committee? So moved, Madam Chair. Senator Weber moves that Senate Bill 2797 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Environment Finance Committee. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Senator Rood. Yes. Senator Weber. Yes. Senator Lang. Yes. Senator Senjum. Yes. Senator Herr. No. Senator Swidinski. No. Senator McEwen? No.
There being four ayes and three nays, the motion carries and is approved. Members, uh, seeing no other business before this committee, we are adjourned. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair.